And I'm going I'm to say something else. This is where the interview maybe takes a turn in a different way. But um, if I'm wrong, I'm prepared to make public apology for what I'm about to say. But um, we're in, we are on the cusp. We are, we are in very dark times, more than people realize. I, I think that people are, are very... Um, I think people are scared. I think people just want to go back to sleep. They want to go back to normal so bad, all these things. But if you have the eyes to see what's happening now isn't just happening now, if that makes sense. What's happening now isn't just happening now. It's been on a long trajectory. In my short years, I already see where my life and the things I experienced in the 80s and the 90s were seed beds for things that are happening now full blown. I, I see it very clearly, and it's all demonic. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go before us, Lord. Bless our time together, and may those who view it be blessed. Thank you, Father. Uh, blessings to everyone who's joining me today. I'm, I'm very excited to have as my guest, Father Turbo Qualls. Is that how you say it, Father? Correct, correct. Uh, a short little bio on Father. Father Turbo is the rector of St. Mary of Egypt Serbian Catholic Church in Kansas City, Missouri, where he lives with his wife, Juliana, and their eight children. Wow. Yeah. Father Turbo is also a retired professional tattoo artist, having studied iconography with the Prosopono School. Prosopono. Prosopono. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and forgive iconography. me, Joseph. Forgive me, Joseph. I don't know if you meant to, but. Uh, what? Go ahead, Ser Father. You said Serbian Catholic. It's Serbian Orthodox. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No problem. It's a problem. Ser Serbian Orthodox Church in Kansas City, Missouri. Father Turbo is also a retired professional tattoo artist. And uh, the Prosapon, you pronounced it well, of iconography, and most notably under the contemporary master iconographer, Father Stamatis Scleris. Yes, the Matis Skiris. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sounds, yeah. Of Athens. Father Tuber further augmented his education skill in iconography by completing the Antiochian House of Studies course in theology with an emphasis in iconography. Father Tuber was also the former dean of chapters for the National Chapter of the Brotherhood of St. Moses the Black. He has lectured in various parts of the United States in regard to the work of evangelization and cultural outreach within the United States. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the way I, I, I found um, Father, how do I address you? Is it Father Turbo? Is that okay? Yeah, Father Turbo is fine. Okay. Yeah. The way I found Father Turbo was I was just searching uh, YouTube and I think the search terms I was using was like orthodoxy and art because I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in orthodox Christianity and I'm, I'm heading that way after being Roman Catholic most of my life. But I'm also very interested in art <clears throat> as somebody, my, my background is in art history. So this YouTube video came up with you, Father. It was, I think it was just short, like 10 minutes. It was art and orth orthodoxy. And this, this orthodox priest came up and he said, that he was, uh, one of his fav favorite artists was Alphonse Mucha, who I really love. And then, and then you, I saw your hand and, you know, you have some tattoos and, and I have some tattoos too. So oh, I thought, cool. <laughs> I thought, oh, wow. And then you were, I think you said you were from LA originally, right? Uh, yeah. So I thought, wow, this is a priest. And I'm from San Francisco. So I said, this is somebody I, I really need to talk to. And here we are. <laughs> wonderful wonderful yeah this is great this is great um yeah thanks for for reaching out and um everything you said is is accurate um i um i it's funny art for me has been um not just a, a pastime it's been a way of life you know and it's a it's been a means by which i um understand and experience life um art has been um, in many ways, the, both the kind of, uh, the sled and the horse that's both, uh, driven me to and, and brought, carried me to Christ, you know? So, um, 
it's I'm, I'm excited you want to talk about that you know to me orthodoxy and art are like indivisible um because prayer is the highest art form and in orthodox um tradition you know art in regards of um iconography and the hymnography and the architecture i mean all of it are means by which we encounter christ so yeah we can <laughs> we can dive into whatever you want you know it's great Father, could you still, I'm always interested in people's personal stories. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't mind, could, could you talk about a little bit about, you know, your childhood growing up, what religion, you know, if any, you were raised in? Yeah. Um, well, I was, I'm an American, so I was raised with American Christianity. And um, what I mean by that is American Christianity, uh, America tends to homogenize traditions mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I've never been Roman Catholic, but I've had Roman Catholic friends and, um, and my mother and my father being from an older generation. And correct me if I'm wrong, Joseph, you know, we're having a discussion, but I, I think there was a time when there was distinctions, you know, someone would say I'm Irish Catholic or, you know, time, and I think those distinctions eventually even began to meld away, right? And so I know a lot of people see that as a positive and there are positive aspects to it, but when I talk about American Christian, I'm talking about homogenized Christianity, where it's just kind of part of a, a, a kind of a part of a, a milieu of, of morality and understanding, which really isn't particular to the person of Christ, but just our identity. Does that make sense where I'm going with that? Um, yes, you're very correct, Father. So, so I, I grew up. So, so if I say like, oh, you know. Um, assembly of God. Some people might know what that is, but it kind of doesn't really matter because my context for Christianity was very much a, a just kind of bland milk that everyone kind of knew about. There wasn't anything particular about it. My parents sent me to a private school, um, and this kind of proves the point, not for um, devotional purposes, but because, you know, education and like that, <laughs> like, that's what you do when you climb the ladder, you know? So um, my parents actually moved from Los Angeles proper to uh, Orange County, Southern California, which are, um, those, are the, those who are not familiar with, with California or Southern California at all, Orange County is a very interesting place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so if you, if you know about Orange County, then it kind of begins to explain a lot of things about me. But I went to a, I went to a private <laughs> school there. Um, from, father, father, yeah. where, were you, where were you born, father? I was born in Lompoc. I was in okay. Lompoc, California, which is north, actually. Right. right? And more central yep. uh, California than it is southern, right? More, uh, more rural. Yeah, rural. Yep, yep, yep. I was born there, and um, but raised in Orange County, raised in Garden Grove. Oh, okay. And so um, that's the context in, in which I was raised, and I was raised in a context in which, you know, art surrounded me. My, my mom, she did interior design and, and my dad was an entrepreneur. Wow. So, yeah. So I had a pretty interesting background. My dad owned a record store um, as well. And so I grew up just with music, all, you know, hearing music, playing music. Um, my cousins are musicians, you know, so just art in a bigger kind of that context is I, I've just been swimming in it my whole life. Um, but there's always this backdrop of, of religion, Christianity. But just to give you an example, you know, like uh, my dad, he would say blessing for the food every night, but he would say it so fast. He never really understood what he was saying. You know, it was, you know, it, it, it was that kind of context, you know. Um, now, my grandmother, my father's mother, she's a Pentecostal minister. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And so I grew up with her. She's a very, she was a very mysterious lady. Um, she lived in Hawaii. She, Tutu, we call her, she was my Tutu, which is like what Hawaiians call grandmother. And she'd fly in every, like, she would fly in in some increment of time that I could never find the rhythm. It wasn't <laughs> like every six months Tutu was here. I just, I never really knew why or when she was coming, but she would, I just know like, okay, I'm getting Tutu. She'd come, she'd stay with us for a period of time. And there was a gentleman named Gene Scott. I don't know if you know, I don't know if you ever heard of Gene Scott, but 
this guy, yeah. Gene Scott, he was, he was quite the character, you know, um, and he would just sit here, sit there on TV all day long, smoking cigars and, you know, writing Greek and just talking about whatever. And my, my grandma, my tutu, she would either be watching Gene Scott or speaking in tongues or, or cooking, you know, so it was, it was a really weird experience. This, this, this figure of my tutu, she was the only, um, she was the only person at that time of my life that was living some sort of active spiritual life. Even though I was going to a Christian school, all that, you know, to my young eyes, she was the only one that was perceptively like spiritual, quote unquote, you know. Was she your was she your your father's mother or your mother's mother? My father's mother. My father's mother. So my father, he was, you know, he he was a bit of a, a prodigal. You know, he was a bit of a prodigal. And so um, I, I think that was, you know, he took care of his mom and everything, but he he was a man of the world, for sure, for sure. And um, so there was this interesting tension uh, in, in my household, you know, whenever Tutu would come. Um, but everything changed. Every, everything changed when my mom got sick. Oh. And my, my mom um, had multiple aneurysms. And... She lost her sight and became uh, crippled, essentially, for, for, you know, she became crippled. This is important because my mom had, you know, her own kind of Damascus Road experience at this time. And this is when not just kind of like some sort of ambiguous religious spirituality, but an actual connection with the living God, with Christ happened in my, in my family. Because... Um, I remember talking to my dad once and, I, and I'd be a young man and just, you know, children are selfish, you know, or unfortunately tend to be inherently selfish. And I was just more upset about us having to lose our home. We lost our home because my father didn't have insurance. So he put everything up, our house, the business, everything to pay the bills for my mom. And I remember just complaining because we had to, we were having to move and I was having to pack things and I'm leaving this house that I was raised in my whole life. So were you a, were, how old father? I'm sorry, were you a teenager at this at this time? Oh no, I'm like, oh gosh, eleven maybe. Oh my lord! So your mother, your mother was ill, very young. Wow. Yeah, yeah, maybe eleven. Might might be maybe a little bit younger. Um, and I just remember complaining to my dad, and my dad just looks at me. He says, you know, "I'm like, why do we have to leave? Why, you know, I understand why we have to lose our house and this and that." He just looks at me and says, you still have a mother, don't you? Mm. You know, and that, and these are these kind of moments that so much of my childhood is, is like kind of fuzzy around the, the edges because of certain things like that. But there's these moments that come into focus where hard truths were being spoken to me. And these things began to really kind of form me and form my understanding of life. And um, that process of, you know, losing our house, moving from a beautiful, large house, swimming pool, all that moving to a town home, moving from a town home to an apartment, uh, like, a, like a house, like a, like a smaller house in a, in a kind of quote unquote worst neighborhood. From that house to, you know, a very bad apartment, from that very bad apartment. Um, and this is, this is going on over a period of years, right? Um, mm -hmm. And from that apartment, basically, by the time I was being able to drive, um, my, my dad and my mom, you know, our family is like destitute. And so I gave them my, Vol I had a Volvo and I gave them my Volvo. I had a 1979 Volvo. I gave them my Volvo that I had so they had a place to sleep. And I just began to, you know, couch surf and go wherever I could. So oh my God. I, I spent, I spent some years um, being functionally homeless, you know, um, and you know, I was in school at the time. I was in college at the time, um, and just trying to make trying to make my way. But this whole period of time was so. I'm just so thankful for it. I mean that that period of just there's so much that happened. You know, I watched my mom, who truly had this Damascus Road experience. I mean, my mom, you know, may God grant her paradise. She she was a woman of the world like my dad. Um, and she was, she had a notorious reputation for being like that. She, 
she went on that operating table, woman of the world, and she rose up a, a, a saint. I mean, her humility, love, patience, a devotion to devotion to Christ. It all came from this incredible suffering. And I watched the years go by of, of having this and just being brought to nothing, being homeless, you know, sleeping in a car that her son gave her. That, oh. that, that changed me, you know, that changed me. Um, and during that time, oh. I, was, I was lost, you know, I was in and out of jail. Um, you know, and for a long time, I'd been involved with, with street culture anyways. Um, and just lots of stuff in the background, the occult, um, all kinds of really nasty stuff. And so I, I bring that up because, you know, a mother, my mother didn't know the specifics of what I was doing, but a mother's intuition and looking back on things, I just, I remember, I can remember ways that she would look at me at times and I would like, you know, go to where their house, go to where their car was parked, you know, and check in on them. And this, this real sadness in seeing me but never a judgment, mm. you know, never, never a judgment. Um, and so when it came time for me to, to, to enter into this place of being at my crossroads and really choosing darkness or light in a very literal sense, um, I thank God that my mom, she was this icon, if you will, of, of someone who was following Christ. And so I encountered evil in a very palpable, real, tangible way. And I knew that the evil that I encountered was not was not the deluded and twisted and seductive evil that I had been playing with for many years. And so much of what I was given as a as a young as a child began to bear roots in me. And then I just knew, wow, okay, if this this evil is not a it's not a heavy metal album cover, right? If this isn't. This isn't cool. This isn't fun. This isn't what I thought it was, right? This is, you know, my time in the occult. Maybe we could talk about that. But but I just, I knew it's like, if this is real, if this is evil as it's showing itself to me, then Christ is real. Christ has to be real. Um, and the only person I knew was my mom, wow. who, who was actually a Christian, you know, who's actually trying to, to follow Christ. And so, you know, um, I remember I was having a, a crisis and uh, I called up my dad, and as soon as the phone picked up, you know, he didn't even say anything. He just says, come home. Oh. He, he just, I, I just, I said, dad, he didn't say anything. He said, just come home. So by that time, they'd gotten a little, very small one-bedroom apartment. God had blessed them and got them out of the street, out of the car, and got them an apartment. And I went to my parents' house, and I just began to confess to them i began to confess just the sorcery the, the, the just everything the drugs the fornication all of it and i lived i slept on my parents floor for like you know almost two years and i spent that two years forgive me how this sounds um but it was almost like you know when, when it speaks about paul went to the arabian deserts for like seven years after his damascus road experience this is kind of like my little moment of disappearing i i you know, I was in bands. I, I was living with um, the singer of my band, which was not a great situation. It was really, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a shooting gallery, you know, it was filled with heroin addicts. And um, oh, that's like, yeah. Yeah, I, I left it. I left that. I left everything. And I just had this radical change. And I thank God because he pulled me out of life. And that's, that's necessary for a lot of people to be completely pulled out of your situation. And um, like I said, I spent the next two years just immersing myself. And I didn't know it at the time, I wouldn't have called it this, but looking back on it, I was trying to repent, you know? And um, yeah, that's, that's kind of like the start of, of where I'm at. It, I, don't, I probably didn't answer your question directly, like, but I'm just trying to kind of give a, a broader picture. Father, Father, beautiful. I, I know now why the Holy Spirit led me to you because I feel a very strong kinship with you mm. because my background is very similar to you. Really? I mean, I, yes, I was up in San Francisco. I had kind of a rough childhood. Uh, you know, um, I was abused by a Catholic priest and my parents were always devout, 
but then I would say in my teenage years, um, like you say, your mother, they became much more, they became quite worldly and, and they will admit that. Um, well, only my mother is, is, is still alive. My father reposed, but, um, I, I got into everything bad that you could get into the occult. Um, I got into pornography as a porn actor. Wow. Um, yeah, gay, gay pornography. I just was in a bad scene, father. And like you, it was my father that said, come home to me. And although I don't know how your relationship with your dad was during those dark times, but me and my dad, it wasn't good. But my dad did tell me to come home. And when you talked about just being with your parents and and that happened to me for years, I just, I, I was led a very crazy life for a long time. And then I just went home and I just kind of healed spiritually, physically, mentally. And, um, and then I came out of that. And my mom and dad provided I was the prodigal son, you know, my mom and dad provided that safe place for me. So God bless you, father. Wow. Yeah. yeah awesome. God bless you, Joseph. I mean, God bless you. I mean, I'm going to tell you something. Um, I feel that kinship with you too, because, you know, I, as a priest now and um, a spiritual father, uh, I have so many people, I deal with it all the time. People have been dealing, dealing with, with shame. I'll say toxic, toxic shame. Cause one of the things that I try to teach my children is we've been conditioned to think shame is bad. Shame isn't bad, actually. Shame, was, shame is given to us so we, we feel compunction. The toxic shame, the one that leads you to despair and, and a, a, a lack of awareness of God's love, that's, that's bad, right? But I try to tell them, like, look, I don't bat an eyelash at anything, right? There is nothing that they can tell me that I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm scandalized. No, it's like. Oh, no, 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 because, and all of the angels rejoice when one sinner repents, and there's nothing, there's nothing like it. When you've experienced the mercy and the love of God from the dark places you and I have come from, that's resurrection. That, that is authentic resurrectional power, and, and only, only Jesus Christ can, can provide that and that's what I've experienced I I was looking I was looking for life as cheesy as that sounds I was looking for it everywhere but you know looking back on it the stone that the builder refuses will always be the head cornerstone yeah I wanted everything but Christ you know I remember Joseph I remember there's these points in time and I don't know why God has had mercy on me I don't deserve it so I'm not saying that like, oh, God is, God's been merciful to me because I did this or that. But I just think there are some things that are important. For instance, I was at a point in my life when I was reading all kinds of esoteric material. I was into Anton Wilson, psychedelics. Um, I was, you know, his book, Cosmic Trigger. I was, I was getting yes. deep into Crowley. I was into yes. you know, Lima. I was, I was into it. Knocking magic. Father. Like, that was my thing. Yeah. Father, wow, I was there with you. Yeah, I mean, that was that was my thing, you know? And I got to that place where I was like, okay, I believe in nothing so I can be open to everything. Like, what is it? I don't care if it's the greys, the aliens. I don't care if it's Kali, you know? I, I don't care. I don't care what it is. I just want to know what's true. And I got to this place, and I think... I think that little crack of light of honesty, and I was being honest at that moment, because I think that's where, where I think that's where God was able to, to get my attention. God was always with me and God is, God is working with everyone. This is something else I know that is very true. And this is hard for a lot of religious folk to hear this. God was with me, even in the depths of my sin, even in the depths of hell. Amen. No, Amen. Father. Right. There's, there's no place. There's no place that, that I went that God wasn't there with me, mourning and, and, and trying to beckon me. Um, and so when this crack of light happens, when I'm just like, I don't care. I just, I just, I just want some measure. Of, I just want truth. It's like he takes an opportunity, that, that window, and, and I, I see 
change happening in my life, you know, looking back at it retrospectively, um, it's powerful. It's powerful. You know, right now, Joseph, my, my, um, my oldest son, he's a prodigal right now. And, um, mm. you know, it's, it's tough. It, it hurt. My heart hurts from him every day, but I know, I know that God is with him. And he, and thanks be to God for, for as bad as he is right now, he's nowhere near where I was at. Like he's nowhere near how bad I was like truly. And I thank God for that. So it's like, if God can pull me out, I just, that I, I was talking to one of my daughters, one of my spiritual daughters. Um, she's a, she's a novice. She's a novice. Um, and I was explaining to her, she was like, you know, you're never worried about anything, you know, you're never worried about anything. And I said, yeah, I'm not worried. I, I have concern and I pray, you know, and I try to go to that place in my heart to be there when, when I'm, when I'm hurting for someone, but I'm not worried. I, I, because I know that if there is any ounce of humanity and freedom left in someone, God's going to use that and grab mm -hmm. them. And hold yes, them. Father. Because I was all but a beast, Joseph. Father, I know. Father, Father, the 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 passage of of the scripture that had resonated so much with me was the the prodigal son didn't really realize how bad things had gotten for him until he was with the swine, and that was me. I was just it was so bad I couldn't sink any lower. Uh, I'm. And people that are familiar with my story know I was just an excrement. It was it was so bad. And I'm interested in why you think you got involved with the occult, because I think I did, is that I think everyone, every human being has this innate instinctual desire for the transcendent, to know God, to believe in God, to you know, to really believe that there's something else besides us and this world. And I, I, I was raised a very, very indifferent Catholic, you know, in the late seventies and eighties, I, I really had no, I was, I was not much more than a, an atheist. And, um, but I always had this desire for something else. And I just didn't know how to find it or where to find it or where to go or who to ask. And in the 80s or late 80s, early 90s, it was, there was so much new age. And that's how I got into the occult. I just got into the new age. And like, it's kind of like the way you said you were raised in a very, um, uh, a sort of collective sort of Christianity. That's the way new age was. You had like Buddha and right. Hindu. Right. And there was some Christianity mixed up in there. And right. and it was, it was all kind of this stuff together. And I thought, well, this is, and I had a very progressive mind and I was like, oh, this is bringing all these cultures of the world together into this one mass harmonious. And, yeah. it did, and it didn't work that way because I did, the new age, I think a lot of times do, does end up just towards Satanism. And that's where I ended up at with the Church of Satan and a lot of weird like Wicca mm -hmm. and uh, Set and, and yeah. the stuff that you were talking about. Um, um, and, and um, Alistair Crowley and sex, sex magic. And I mean, father, you name it, I got into it. And um, so that void that I was trying to fill, I'm sorry to be so belabored, that void I was trying to fill, that real dark hole in my soul just got bigger and bigger. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the things that people need to understand, the reason for that is, is because the heart, um, the heart is, is a vessel, it's a temple by which either the holy dwells or darkness will dwell. Like we, I'm really big on the fact that um, we have to remember that we're dealing with intelligences. Hmm. Like we, like when you, people who are falling into the occult and all the different esoteric um, teachings and, and rights and all that, it, it, we still can approach that in a very um, materialistic, um, almost kind of academic way. 
never realizing that behind all those things lie actual beings, right? <laughs> like, like these beings and these spirits, they do, Crowley said it himself, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, God forgive me for paraphrasing Crowley, but he says, you know, you don't have to search for them, they'll come for you. This is what Crowley teaches. They will come for you, right? If you just get out, if you just put yourself forward, they'll come for you. You don't have to search hard for them. And that's what a lot of people don't, don't realize. And, and um, my journey into the occult has everything to do with me being primed. And, and for me, it was um, my imagination, my psyche, as well as some of my, my natural giftings, right? I, I've, I've been, um, I've been an, I, I'm like a natural artist. Everyone is creative. Everyone has potential, has created potential. But not everyone is, is like an artist in that sense, if you're following me, right? You know, um, you can teach someone to paint, but that doesn't necessarily make them an artist. There's a certain dis disposition and there's a gifting of being able to um, interact with reality in such a way that you can articulate and express it in an artistic way that is unique in particular to an artist's disposition. Does that make sense, right? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Experience. So I've had that. Um, I've never, I've never one day in my life said, well, what am I going to do? I've always, I just always known I was going to be an artist of some kind. And even me being a priest, it's the fulfillment of being an artist, to be honest with you. It's everything has been moving into that. So I say that because um, that was, that's how I got hooked initially, right? I got hooked through, um, visuals you know uh i was sh i was sharing with someone earlier this week you know i was reading or attempting to read the upanishads and the vedas you know <laughs> like before i was like that time my parents my mom was sick that's the time i'm reading things so all this is happening before i'm 12 years old and i know that Me? is I, I know that is anomalous but that's that's my story so all of those things were ways in which i was being primed and kind of drawn into it so when, when I start getting into um music particular music and particular things certain things are making sense just like and, and I know for a lot of people this is this is tough to hear this but I was a big fan of Dungeons and Dragons I grew up in that era and I played it it's fun I love Dungeons and Dragons whatever but the thing that people have to understand is many of the gods that are in the game I mean they're taking from real mythology and when I found that out, I was like a kid in a candy store. I was like, wow, this is, this stuff is real? Are you kidding me? Great, you know? And I, I'll tell you something, Joseph. I'll tell you something. And, and God bless him wherever he's at. I, I pray that God has led him to a place of repentance. But um, fifth grade, how old is someone in fifth grade? I don't even, I should know this. I have kids, but uh, what are you? 11 or 11? 11? 11-ish, right? Right, so um, a guy, his name was Brandon, and he was the recess monitor at my, my Christian school. Are you following me? Well, she might be able to tell where this story is going to go. And I don't know why he was, I don't know who vetted these people, right? But he, looking back on it now, Brandon, he must have been someone's like son or, or, or cousin or something, because he must have just needed a job because... He was definitely, you know, uh, uh, early to mid 20 something, right? Clearly a burnout guy looking back on it now, you know what I mean? Like, mm. and he's the one who introduced me to these worlds. He's the one who turned me on to Michael Moorcock, who was my, my favorite fantasy author, who, who gave me these, these building blocks to understanding, um, even though people are like, well, it's just fantasy. No, no, no. There's more to it than that. He's also the one who began to show me that these gods in D&D were real. Mm. So I, I say this because, you know, gods used it. But at the time, he was definitely an agent of the enemy. Like he didn't, um, of course, he wasn't thinking that way. I'm not, think, I'm not saying that he was, you know, kind of, you know, parts of Malcovanian plot to come get me. You know what I mean? But that influence in this Christian school where quote unquote, I guess people sent their kids to be safe from those influences. It found me there. You know what I mean? It found me and he just opened that door a little bit 
And it, it just, my curiosity sparked. You know, Joseph, it says in Deuteronomy 20, 20, 29, 29, um, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us, our children forever. And this is important because people don't realize that there's a curiosity, and the fathers talk about this, there's a curiosity that is very unhealthy and dangerous. And that is what's lying inside of most people too, is this desire, it's forbidden fruit to some degree. It's a desire to, it's a pride to want to go beyond your, your ability to know things and people will search things out, right? Yeah. And this is, because right, occult means hidden, right? The occult means hidden. So this idea and this ability to, to peek into hidden things, oh, this is great. Now you take a kid like me, I'm the, I am the only black kid in this whole school, not that that matters, but at the time, you know, besides my older sister who had already graduated and left, I'm, I'm severely overweight. There's all these things that are going on where I'm already struggling with who I am as a person, as an identity. Mm. And here comes the ability to know something that others don't know. Exactly. Here comes the ability yeah. to potentially take my will. And, and the fact that I'm a kid that I'm even learning about the will and all these other kids are, these kids are playing GI Joe and doing whatever, but I'm learning about the will. See how that pride is starting to puff up, you know? Um, and that is what really primed me again. That, that word priming is really important because by the time I'm entering into a place where I'm having access to John D and Anaki and Magic and Thelema and Crowley, I'm ready to go. Yeah. I, I'm not having, I'm not having to go through all these kind of like initial kind of, you know, um, I'm not having to be a neophyte in that sense. I already have the, 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 I already have the context in my, in my psyche to begin to, to understand and being an artist intuit symbol and, and intuit these realities. So sigils, like, Oh, they made sense to me. Okay, let's go. Let, let's and and on top of that, and I know it's going to sound crazy to you. Um, a, a very a, a developing of my palette of of darkness and and being a villain. I was always attracted because I was just um, when you read comic books. I'm a big comic book nerd too, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things you understand: what makes the greatest villains are they are they are people who. The difference between a superhero and a villain is the superhero takes the struggles, the rejection, the isolation, and they use it for good. They, mm -hmm. they, they, use, it to, they use it to look to the other, right? A villain takes, you know, humiliation, struggle, trauma, quote unquote, all that stuff, and they turn inward they, in, in the wrong ways. Not, not with, not with a, a, a holy introspection, but a bitterness. You know, they turn inward in, in, in that way. And I was primed for that too, you know? Um, and the power, you know, Joseph, I know you know this, the, uh, the light travels through sickness and grief. Yes, yes. But darkness travels through pleasure and power. Yes. Right? And seeing my mom and her sickness and grief, why would I want that? You know what I mean? Why, why would I, why would I want to go through that? Why, why would I want that? You know, I want vengeance on my enemies. I, I want to, I want to rub it in the face of those who made fun of me for being fat or being, you know, whatever it is. I want to be able to, to make myself in this vestige of something so much greater than I was. And I want them to see, I mean, that was so much of my motivation for being on stage and playing in bands. That was so much of my motivation for being in punk rock and, and trying to harness destructive energy. Yes. You know? Father, Father, that's why I got into pornography too. And, and Father, much of your story, I would say almost 100% of it, runs very parallel to mine because I had trauma in, in my early life. I also felt very alienated and picked upon. Part of it had to do with the abuse. And I was just an odd, I was an odd kid. And there's something you said about the creative impulse in some people that's very important because I always considered myself, even though I was a mediocre artist, I always considered myself a creative and artistic person, very open to new ideas, new experiences, you know, especially as a young person. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
But if you don't have a sense of discernment, it can really be, it can really open a door to a lot of evil things. And I think also, and I've talked about this in terms of pornography a lot, because I think people who are traumatized or who are, do feel alienated or do feel um, different or pornography can be a very potent um, medium uh, towards fantasy. And it was for me, it, it was a very big, I spent hours as a kid at school, like during recess, I always had like a, like a, 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 um, a notebook, a paper and pencil and um, not colored pencils or markers at that time, but I just drew constantly all these little fantasy worlds of, uh, I don't know what they were, just heroes and knights and just like you and villains. And I just lived in that world, that fantasy world forever. And boy, that was not good. Um, it's because I, yeah, it's escape. And I think I was so desirous for a friend, for company, that I just invited everything in. It's it's kind of bad. And it's that that translated to the real world when I got older and I just I fell into this whole strange world of of goth and and just a lot of weird stuff. And I found a kinship that it was a weird kinship with people I sh should other of other lost people. And then it just becomes this toxic environment where everybody's lost, but you're trying to reaffirm each other, but you can't. And um, everybody's looking for something. And it, it, so everything you said, nothing father sounded weird or strange to me at all. It sounded yeah, true. I mean, it I sounded mean, like a true, true experience that I think is, I don't think it's unusual nowadays. I think maybe, I think you and I are kind of part of the same generation. I think it was maybe a little different back then, but nowadays, because the subcultures are so proli prolific. Right. That and that's the, you bring up a really great point there, Joseph, because um, uh, subcultures are kind of another emphasis for me, another area of, however you want to experience or I don't want to say expertise but you know something I'm very interested in uh, because it's it's been my experience um father father turbo started to interrupt you but the internet has really caused this proliferation of of like deviant subcultures because people I mean in my day you didn't have that you had to go and to a club or to search to, it out yeah a lot of times it did gravitate towards musical acts or something because I got into like some hardcore, you know, music and you gravitated around that. But now all these strange subcultures, you can find them on the internet. Sorry, right. Father. No, no, it's great. I mean, it, it's it's interesting you say that because um, this is a comment I've made to my oldest son and some other people. Um, it's very different, you know, back in that day, you could, right? So looking for a tribe, right? So subculture fills that tribe very easily. I could look at someone and know, more or less you're kind of part of my tribe right it's like oh you like Bauhaus oh you like you know whatever it's like okay great so so we begin to talk you know and um and it was easy then but with um there was a commercialization of subculture that began to happen mm. um in the in the early 2000s you know stores like Hot Topic and things like that and I started to see people adopting the aesthetic but not having the ethos if that if that makes sense it's like i remember talking with someone like on, on campus and i was like oh i'll talk to her because she like she looked like she won my tribe she might be you know kind of gothy looking kind of death rock whatever we talk she has no idea what i'm talking about and and she she had bought the clothes easily and kind of began to put 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 the look together but the music, which the music is how you got the ethos, if, if that makes sense. Like the, the music communicated the ethos and the ethos kind of, uh, uh, you know, validated and made authentic the, the look. And that's how you, that's how, you know, the kind of social construct worked. Well, the reason why it's so kind of, it's even more dangerous now is because that process of having to having to search and even having to go through some kind of rites of initiation, that weeded out a lot of people. 
and probably for their own good, right? It probably weeded out a lot of people for their own good. But when you lower those barriers, then what happens is, is people take all the low level, low hanging fruit of, of the darkness and, they, and, it, and it makes it even less innocuous. You don't even, you, you have yes. an even, you have, you're even more ignorant to what you're getting into. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Father, Father, this is so profound. And I and I've tried to write about this in in my book. Um, I'll send it to you. Please. Um, I in the in the '90s I noticed this the singer Madonna. Uh-huh. You know, especially when she started co-opting a lot of this BDSM bondage aesthetic, mm-hmm. dressing that way. And I was like, okay. And it was very shocking at that time. But now you see it everywhere, and it's everywhere. like that that aesthetic that bondage leather vinyl mm-hmm. you see it not in as extreme i see it just look in on the yeah. street yep. is that that's rife with occultism so you're right that's the low-hanging fruit and people have no idea what they're getting into they have they have, they have no idea i mean um i was you know uh, i was talking with a, a good friend you know and she has a sibling who has just fallen down this what we're describing she's just falling down this rabbit hole almost textbook at the level we're talking about now, you know, and it's getting into even broader things, trans, transhumanism, not even, not even transgenderism, but transhumanism. And I mean, people don't understand, um, Joseph, you know, I, I, I've said this before, we are, we are at the cusp um, of a new age and we're already in it, but we're at the cusp where people are going to start seeing it on a whole other level. And we are going to start seeing monsters again. Yeah. We're going to start seeing monsters again. And it's, it's frightening to me because, again, you know, I, I remember, again, <laughs> being a kid. And there was, the, there was a place in, in L.A. Um, called The Gauntlet. And the Gauntlet was, that was you know, they were so cutting edge. They were the only place, like, they were the place, if you wanted to know about piercings and, um, you know, just the whole subculture there. Piercings and everything else now is just so passe. I know. You know what I mean? But, like, I remember, like, that was intimately tied to, to sex culture, which was intimately tied to you know, peripheral spiritualities, right? All of those things were linked, yeah. right? But the problem now is because it's prolif- the proliferation of it is so wide, people think that it's not linked anymore, I but know. it is. All it means is now it's just become more palatable and more spread out for people. Um, and it's tough because I know some people will look at me now, maybe, and they'll be like, oh, you know what you are? You're that <laughs> typical guy, you know, who was progressive and liberal and all these other things and you know you had a crisis and now you're swinging to the other end and I'm that's not me at all actually right um because I for me personally I have a big heart and anyone in that world it's like you're st- that's still my people and I want to bring them to Christ you know what I mean I, I want to bring them to Christ um but the fact of the matter is is you know I want to help them separate um, the worthless from from that which has worth. I want to be able to 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 pull out, pull them out of that without taking. You know, God doesn't want to take away their creativity. God doesn't want to destroy their love of life. He wants to actually give them life. But people perceive the 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 joining with Christ as the taking away of all my fun, taking away all the things, all the spice of life. And it's no, 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 no. What you think is spice is actually rat poison. <laughs> it, it's just, it's, it's killing you. You know what I mean? Um, and I, I think it's really important to say that because as you know, Joseph, um, that aesthetic for me, that, that aesthetic, right? Coming out of that culture, especially, you know, like goth and death rock culture and all that stuff, you know, punk rock. If you really like that aesthetic, well, well then why don't you come to a bridegroom service on Holy Week, and if you want some, if you want some ominous, if you want to feel something ominous, come to a Lenten service. You know what I mean? And, and, and do you see what I'm saying? Like everything you're longing for, the the, the church 
provides that for you, but it provides it in a way that is life-giving. Well, there, there, there's so much I want to unpack real quick um, that you talked about. It's so important. I just want to make sure that people get it. Um, yeah, when, when I got tattoos and um, piercings, I was heavily, heavily into piercings. When I got that in the early 90s, people, tattoos were completely bizarre still. Um, piercings, not in the ear, but like right. tongue, yeah. nose, other parts of the body, that was like, okay, what, what is this? Right. I mean, now that's completely mainstream, totally. Tattoos, all that stuff is, is mainstream. Um, so, and, and in terms of like homosexuality, I want to talk about that too because I, I think that that plays a part. When, when I came out as gay back in 1988, and this is part of what drew me to the gay subculture, it was still considered very transgressive. I mean, now it is not, you know, kids at Catholic schools come out as gay. They have pride day, they have, have the pride flag and all this stuff. It's very like ho-hum, you know, oh, you know, someone's born gay, God made them gay. It's, it's no big deal. It's right. like, it's like, it's like nothing. Right. And then the other part about the transhumanism that you talked about is very important too, because I, I haven't done it since COVID, but I outreach it. Um, I've done it in West Hollywood as well. It used to be down, you know, in, in your neighborhood, but, um, mainly in San Francisco, like the Folsom street fair, these different, um, mm -hmm sex fairs and I didn't experience this as a gay person back in the 90s it hadn't really emerged it was sort of a weird a weird niche niche culture but now I see it all over where people are taking on the uh I don't know, it's not personality but they take on um this aura or spirit of of an animal specifically oh, the furries? like dogs no that's different the furries are like people that dress up in sort of these these strange costumes that are kind of like almost like a cartoon character of a fox okay. or a dog or a cat or something but they don't really like i don't think they really take on the the spirit of the animal like um, animism the animism thank you father but there's these like uh people who actually like will wear a dog mask mm -hmm. and go around on leashes and are on all fours and our dogs are barking. And I like reach out to the, I mean, they have like masters who are human, but um, I try to reach out and sometimes they're in pens and they're, I go, this is demonic possession. This is really yes. scary. And, and I don't say that with malice or any kind of judgment because I was there, let me tell you, right. Right. you know. Um, which, by the way, Joseph, forgive me. I just want to say this is important to understand. Um, the tradition of the church, the spirit of the church, especially never looks at the demonic possessed and demonic possession as like, ooh, get away. Oh, like it, it's never a judgment thing. It's always in, in you know, um, a deep mercy, you know, um, just reading this morning about um, St. Anthemus, who was the spiritual father of St. Uh, Nikiforos the leper, St. Anthemus of Kios. And he, be, part of his ascent into sainthood was he was barely literate. He was, he was, he was barely literate, began to read. And part of, um, once he began to actually read, then he was ordained a priest. And um, he, one of the, his first kind of real act of people were like, oh, the grace of God's with him is, there was a demon possessed man in his village that was chained to this kind of like hollowed out tree. Um, and this is a modern time, by the way. Um, and he was, you know, naked and howling like the demoniac of the Gadarenes, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, priests and other people, they were just so scared to be, to get next to him, but they would read prayers, just really scared. And he would just, he'd be one of the ones who with courage would read, you know, prayers of exorcism and, and, and read prayers of intercession for this man. And eventually through his prayers in particular, um, this man was healed of his demonic possession. But the reason why I bring it up, and I was just reading about it today, so um, obviously the Holy Spirit had that for us today. Um, demonic possession and, and the oppression of the demonic 
of, of human beings, the church never looks at those human beings with disdain and disgust, right? Truly, yeah. it, it is always in a spirit of mercy and, and desire for their healing and deliverance. So important because one of the ways that the devil wages war is um, pushing people off of the world path, right? A temptation to the right where there's a hyper-correct, hyper-moralist view. Right. And that, pers that perspective begins to look at people um, with disdain. I don't look at people with disdain, whether they're Satanists, heroin addicts, gangbangers, um, transgender, homosexual, whatever. I don't look at them with disdain. I don't, I don't condone what they do, but I, I, I look at them with love and mercy and a desire for them to be brought out of bondage. Thank you. Love. I mean, Thank you. forgive me how that sounds, but that's, to sounds, me, that's, that's the source of my priesthood. Because it sounds, it sounds beautiful to me, because and that's the way I try to live my, my missionary postulate. I'm so concerned, Father, um, and I'm not, I'm, I understand, and social media, and I don't understand it, and I, I'm an observer of it, and I'm not, but when I see, like, if you're familiar with, like, TikTok, I see, like, people manifesting, like, demonic possession on there all the time, and my heart goes out to them, because I know what it is, and I know what it looks like, and um, it's not good. It's not good. I just, I just think... I think there's a big problem and I don't think people understand it. And I don't think people, and I think people fall into it. I, I don't want to make excuses for people, but I think people fall into it, not of their own choice a lot of times, because I think they're fooled. Um, because when I was into these, these bondage, whatever subcultures there, I saw something it's, and it's still in that, in that niche community, it's still called the St. Andrew cross. And I saw people, you know, strapped to this and I had no idea, but when I got out of it, I was like, oh my gosh, a lot of this is a reenactment, very strange and pathetic of, of you know, Christian symbolism and ritual. And um, so there is something potent there, but it's, it's completely twisted. And I got into it. I got into it. And in Catholicism, it's, it's especially sad. It's not so much in orthodoxy because orthodoxy has kept a lot of its tradition and ritual, but uh, Roman Catholicism had lost so much of that. And then again, I go back to that instinctual desire I think for, that people have. And I didn't know any of that as a child, but I still had that instinctual desire. And that's why I think a lot of times I was drawn to the occult because there is something there I think that's real and I think people respond to it. So yeah, forgive me, Joseph. Um, for me, it's not a matter of I think I know. Wow. It, there is something there is something real. There are things real behind it. And that being that um, sexual device, the, that perversion, the St. Andrew's cross. That's not accidental, right? These low level kind of, someone may say they're incidental um, parallels with Christian ritual and symbol. They're not incidental, they're, they're intentional. And this is how people get possessed. They give, they, give them, they give rights to the devil, to the demons through these, through these acts. It says in the scriptures, my people perish because of, because of lack of knowledge, because of ignorance. And so many Christians, people who would be otherwise on a path towards, towards God, they get seduced. Yeah. And they don't, they don't, they don't even realize what they're, do, what they're doing, yeah. you know? Um, and I'm going I'm to say something else. This is where the interview maybe takes a turn in a different way, but um, if I'm wrong, I'm prepared to, make public apology for what I'm about to say, but um, we're in, we are on the cusp, we are, we are in very dark times, more than people realize. I, I think that people are, are very, um, I think people are scared. I think people just wanna go back to sleep. They wanna go back to normal so bad, all these things. But 
if you have the eyes to see what's happening now isn't just happening now, if that makes sense. What's happening now isn't just happening now. It's been on a long trajectory. In my short years, I already see where my life and the things I experienced in the 80s and the 90s were seed beds for things that are happening now full blown. I I, I see it very clearly. And it's all demonic. And and people, I'm going to say something to you too, Joseph. And I, I know for a lot of people, it's just too much. But I really believe that a lot of the ignorance of people especially, you know, I'm a Protestant convert, so I can say this. A lot of Protestants and evangelical culture, um, unwittingly, let's say, but nevertheless, has facilitated a kind of um, cynicism. It's facilitated a kind of inoculation to where when you talk about the demonic, when you talk about these things, people go like, you sound like some fundamentalist preacher from the 80s. You, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. It, it, it's, it's, it's facilitated this spirit of a scoffer that Peter talks about in his epistle, right? Oh, okay, demonic. Okay, you think the devil's under every rock. Okay, and it's just like, things are happening so quickly, they don't understand. For instance, Joseph, these things are mimetic. The virus, the real virus, is, comes through the screen. People will watch something on TikTok, they'll watch something on CNN, whatever, and boom, right? Because because what's happening is it's magic on a very broad and deep level. Spells are being casted and people are being brought into that spell. And that spell then opens them up to all kinds of impressions. Those impressions, which come through thoughts, which come through culture, which come through suggestive material, right? Music, food, right? Gormandizing is a way of getting into these things. Foodie culture, all that stuff, right? I know that's, people are going to go crazy when they hear this, right? But I'm just telling you, it's like every area of life yes. is under assault right now and looking to grab people. And, it, and it's working. It's working. Yes. yes. There's, there's something that, that concerns me too, because I, I think you're talking about a progression or regression, <laughs> Um, from from when we were young in the 80s and 90s. Um, I mean, I got burned out. I would say I was in my late 20s and that was by the late 90s, almost 2000. And I mean, I had been in, in the scene for quite a while and I didn't jump into something like really deep and dark right away. I mean, I kind of, you know, it kind of starts out slowly, like where you're I don't know, you you take on some certain affectation or whatever. And then by the time I checked out, I mean, there was like nothing I hadn't done yet. So when I outreach at Pride, like Pride is like, I mean, Pride in San Francisco is the largest gathering of LGBTQ people in the world. It's over a million people. But I mean, New York, LA, uh, every everybody, even small towns have them now. And um, Pride in San Francisco is very corporate. There's Apple, there's Facebook. I don't know who else is there. Virgin Atlantic. uh, I don't know. Everybody's there. At Burger King, everybody. Um, With with a presence, a big corporate presence. And um, that is very different. And even in the 90s, when I used to go, um, it was much, it was mainly for gay men. And it still had a very, it still had a transgressive quality um, about it. Now it's different. There's families, there's kids, there's very young people, there's teenagers. Um, there's still a transgressive quality there. It's smaller and it's a little more hidden, but it's still there. But the floats and the processions are very odd. Um, a lot of times they do have the semblance of a religious event. And um, what, but what really concerned me too was how much younger everyone there is. Um, it's a young audience. Um, and people are coming out at a much younger, younger age, um, which is concerning to me. Um, you have children nowadays coming out, prepubescent children coming out as transgender. And then I see um, also when I outreach, I see a lot of body modification um that I had never seen in the 1990s and I was 
you know, I was in a hardcore scene. So um, that's really scary to me. I, I, not, not much shocks me, not much. But when I started seeing all this body modification and in young people, I was like, wow, there's really something. Something's wrong. Something, 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 something is a foul. And, um, and again, I say that as someone who's, a, you know, I'm, I'm heavily tattooed still, you know, I mean, I, I'm. Not so, just father, father, not just tattoos, but having oh, no. removed. I'm talking about implants. I'm, having, and, I'm talking about people removing their nipples, people removing digits. Um, I, 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 yes, I'm with you, Joseph. People, you know, the eyeballs, the blacking of the eyeballs. See, the, see, what's interesting to me is, for instance, this is starting to, this is starting to have, it's starting to ascend in popularity, the, the blacking of, of the eyes, the tattooing of the eyes, right? The actual sclera of the eyes, right? People can roll their eyes at me. I don't really care. I'm just going to tell you. This is very fascinating to me because, um, and, and forgive me, it just, this is, I'm just going to share with you how it worked out. My, I, I went from 1995. So basically from 1995 to about 97, right? So I had a two year period of, hell oh. where i was if god didn't come and save me i was going to be the guy on the side of the road talking to plants that's that's who i was going to be right and this is my first experience of years of trying to summon something years of trying to have an experience right when it finally when they finally came it was terrifying absolutely terrifying and these these handful of manifestations, which were particularly uh, potent, I've had I've had multiple, multiple, but there's a handful of ones that are very potent. And the way that they manifested to me was the blacking out of the eyes. This is in 95, 95, 96, 97. Okay. I had, I had, Father, sorry to interrupt you. I had the weird contacts at those times, you know, mm -hmm. the color. And, and, I'm, and, I'm a, and so let me just kind of walk you through this. So, I don't, I don't remember um, what, what year the show was, but there was a show called True Blood. I don't know if you remember that show. I do, I do. There was an episode there where there was um, a character, I can't remember what, she was kind of like a Greek uh, site, like Circe or something like that. And I remember having to, you know, I shouldn't have been watching it in the first place, you know? Uh, and I turned it off and I was just shook to the core because it was the first time in like popular media that I'd seen this um like they, for them it's a it's a cinematic you know uh kind of aesthetic whatever but the character she's like a human whatever the spirit comes in her and her eyes went black mm. and i i lost i was like this is crazy right because you have to understand there's people now who are writing and they do podcasts they talk about the spiritual world and and and, and all that stuff it, and that's, I'm, I'm glad people are doing that, but I just want to be very clear when I'm talking with you and whoever else hears this. This is my experience long before many people who talk about this stuff were even Orthodox. Long before I was Orthodox. Long before there was Netflix and really internet as we understand it, this is my experience. And so when I say like, oh, this is how I experienced the manifest, one of many ways in which I've experienced people being possessed, and demonic manifestation in a human being. When I saw that happen, you know, almost 10 years later on a popular TV show, that's not a mistake. That, mm -hmm. that isn't, right? When you understand how these things, you don't come up with ideas. You know, we are receiving these, these insights, right? And so that person, that screenwriter, whoever, he didn't come up with that. He thought, oh, this will be kind of cool. He didn't come up with that. That was suggested to him. I experienced that. So I know, forgive me for belaboring it, but this, this is what I'm trying to get at. This is what happened, you know, 10 years later, I saw this on TV. Now I'm seeing it happen in real life where people are doing that to their eyeballs on purpose, right? I'm trying to show that all of these material rites, they don't see them as rites or rituals, but that's what's happening. And it, and it gives an ascent in which their soul could become susceptible to become uh, uh, possessed 
right? You, you are now taking on an affect, right? And it's, it's really worse than, you know, the, the, the animist, the person who is in, you know, Indonesia or, you know, the, the Northwest portion of the Congo who is channeling spirits, they at least know what they're doing to some degree. Like they're trying to get a spirit. This person who is taking on, you know, you know, tattooing Kali on them or whatever, they don't realize that they're, that they are opening themselves up for, for possession. Yeah. And it's, and it's being, it's being disseminated through the, through the, uh, the internet and the waves, because when a kid sees that, they may think, oh, that's cool. That's cool. But they don't know that it's actually a, a real, a real manifestation of something. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It, Perfect. And I think, I think people, some people believe that they can be a casual observer of this stuff. Like I can just sort of watch it, maybe be entertained by it, but I'm just curious about it and it's not going to affect me. No, 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 no. I don't. Think so no, no, oh, you can't. I mean, if you take the spiritual life seriously, anyone who's taking the spiritual life seriously, we've all gone on this road. It's like, Okay, yeah, you know, you're free, right? You're, you're, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial, as the scripture says. So you can, you can do that if you want, but if you're going to take the spiritual life serious, you're going to very quickly realize, oh, I can't passively look at these things and grow in, 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 in my spiritual life. I can't grow in, in God with that. No. You have to let those things go. No, and, and what's run parallel to this um, occultism in um, culture, I hate to come back to this, is pornography, because in my lifetime, I've seen pornography, and not that Playboy is good, because it's, it's kind of like weed a lot of times, it's a gateway drug. Right. Um, sure. I've gone from porno the pornography of, porn of Playboy to readily available, hardcore BDSM porn on the internet that's available to everyone. You know, when I was a kid, you had to steal the Playboy out of the liquor store. Right. Now kids can just go onto a computer and see the most unbelievable. I mean, and, and again, Father, I'm not a prude. I was in pornography, but the pornography that I saw in the 1990s, I can't believe what's being made now. It's unbelievable. I, if I would have seen that as a kid, I don't know what I would have ended up as. I don't know. And yeah. I ended up as I ended up as a mess, just being exposed to things like Playboy and Penthouse. Yeah, but yeah. I, I'm I, I'm very fearful. Well, I see the young people now that have been exposed to this stuff as young. They don't know if they are a boy or a girl. Now, yeah. like you're saying with transhumanism, they don't even know if they're a human being. That's right. I mean, and Joseph, forgive me. Ugh. I, I'm just I'll, I'll say this. I won't get too political about it, but. Um, you have a conditioning of, of the masses that has been put into effect, which if, if we last that long, God help us, what, what's gonna, what the future is going to look like in the next 10 years. I mean, all of these, there's so many young people who are already isolated and struggling and having access to these things. Well, we all know what happened the last two years right? People being, you know, locked down and all that good stuff. Yeah. The exposure and the psychological damage. Listen, one of the things that you'll find, there, there are some core things that run, there, there, there are core common experiences that you'll find in people who are experiencing possession, like real possession, right? Um, a very common experience is, um, abuse, particularly yeah. some sort of sexual abuse and or exposure. So almost if you will, like a traumatic sexual abuse through exposure of the psyche, if you understand what I'm saying, yeah. right? These are means by which the devil's condition, they break down condition and then reorientate the psyche of the human being. And then from there, they got the soul. Is that, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And this, so. is ha this has happened in mass in mass the last two years because mm. I, i'm gonna tell you something people were talking about they were trying and god bless people for trying people were trying to put a, a a good spin on what happened with the lockdowns and everything and 
oh, St. Mary of Egypt, and she was in the desert, blah, blah, blah. And let me tell you something. All that's hooey. Because when St. Mary of Egypt was in the desert, she wasn't having lockdown chocolate and lockdown sex and lockdown Netflix and all those things. She was praying. She was fasting. She was suffering. What, what's happened the last few years with people being locked in their homes, unfettered. Listen, when P- Joseph, when people were put into their homes two years ago through whatever, they already were addicted to, they already had their vices full blown. So now they were, they were isolated to a greater degree, which just, I'm telling you from experience, I've seen any people, their passions, it was like gas was put on the, gas was put on the kindling and the, the mattress thrown. And so these people, hell has begun to manifest. I know, Father. In the minds of, 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 of millions of people. It, it, people don't under just people do not understand no i know the, the 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 ramification of what's happened qualitatively and quantitatively both quantitatively it's insane we it's insane and qualitatively it, it's god help us you know um, uh, yeah father I, I yeah no 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 father i just want to uh it, this isn't dropping a bomb on you but i want to drop it on some of my listeners because um I've, I've had this struggle with trying to, people really, really super criticize me, especially for my first book. Um, I mean, the, all the way from the title, which was followed by Satan. Um, you know, they just like, oh, Joe, you're being sensationalistic. You know, um, why are you talking about this stuff? It's going to lead people to sin. And, and I'm like, if anybody's turned on by what I wrote, there's, they have deeper problems. Mm-hmm than my book but a lot of christians are just they have their head in the sand they just don't know what's going on like you said and one of the most scary emails i got and i get a lot of emails but um it was from a mother who's one of her kids had gotten really obsessed with pornography and then it went into bestiality and i was just like oh my god i don't know Help us. And this was not, this is a good, a good, I, I mean, I don't know though, but from what I could surmise is a good family. Yeah. Well, the good family is the filet mignon. Yes. Yeah. You know, the good family is the filet mignon. And I mean, um, my family has been touched by it. Like I said, my son's a prodigal and I, I had to tell my son, I said, you know, when I be, when I was ordained, I sat my whole family down. I said, listen, guys, you know, I'm sorry, but you have to understand you guys are all targets now. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I said, not just because I'm a priest, but because of who I am. I, I am. I'm a traitor. I'm coming out of that kingdom of darkness. You're right. Not only, not only, yeah. am, I, not only am I coming out of that kingdom of darkness, but I'm, I'm coming against it as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, my love for Christ is the greatest thing, but trust me when I tell you, I have, a, I have a strong hatred for the darkness. And, you know, the things that my, the things that my son has been tempted with, and he, I've told him as much, and I just, I pray for God's protection and mercy on him, but it's not an accident. The things that he's been exposed to, the things that have come after him. Um, and I've, I've had to tell him this. I said, look, you know, this thing has come for you because of who your father is. And I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that, but, you know, it's up to you to make these choices, whether you want to be a part of that or not. And, you know, for him, he's a materialist right now. He just, he doesn't see that, but this is the thing. Good families, you know, people who are actually trying to to live some sort of a decent life. um, We can never be ignorant of the wiles of the enemy. Yeah. Father, I, it's, it's interesting how this conversation worked out. I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, I could talk to you for days. But um, when I prayed about talking to you, I was just like, you know, I'm not sure what I want to talk to Father about. I think I'm going to talk about orthodoxy with him. But because I, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm non-Eastern European like you. So um, I just kind of wanted to talk about, you know, your, because you did a, um, I think you did a, a video um, on on you know your, your what drew you to Orthodox, and I wanted to talk more about that with you, but we didn't. But I think the Holy Spirit guided me and 
to this dis and you to this discussion because I think it needs to be heard. And um, and I've I've had similar not I've had similar discussions like this, but not as not as strong, not as powerful as this. And one of the ways I end it, and I think you're really the right, a right person to talk about this with because you're a father, but you're also a father. And um, and I get messages from so many people where parents, where their their children are lost, they're oh, they're involved in so many things. They have the occult, they're transgender, they're gay, they're atheists, they're just so many different things. And I feel a strong kinship with these people as well, because my parents were there. I was for, I think for a lot of people, if they would have seen me 25 years ago, they would have said, this person is beyond help. He's, um, he's a lost cause. Um, he's one of those people that, you know, they see on the streets of San Francisco. That's just like, you know, they're, they don't have long to live. And I, and I think my parents, I mean, prayed so, especially my father prayed so intensely for me because I think that was a real possibility, but, you know, I always, and it sounds stupid or, you know, but I always tell people, I said, nobody is beyond the reach of our Lord and, um, no one is a lost cause. And a lot of times I tell people, it, it sounds like you're telling them to do nothing or to give up. But I know that my dad prayed very intensely for me for years and he struck, he suffered a lot while I was very lost. And I think that had a lot to do with me eventually getting out, out of that. So I was wondering, I mean, what you would say, and I'm sure you've said it to people, especially f family, parents, who have children that are struggling, who might be lost right now, and they just don't know what to do. Don't be scared to suffer. Mm. Might, yeah, fa father, father, let me just say this really quick. Um, that's really important because my dad always did embrace the cross. And I think that's scary for people. I mean, it's scary for me. Nobody wants to suffer, but my dad, God rest his soul, um, he did. He embraced the cross. Yeah, I, I I'm looking right now. Um, I have a picture of my parents, you know, in front of me right now above the screen. I'm looking at them right now, and um, I think I've never done this before, and I'm thankful for being with you today. Um, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that Lord Jesus. Um, I'm so thankful that he allowed, he allowed my mom and my dad to go to the grave, seeing me turn my life around. Mm. I'm glad that they were able to, you know, they saw me, the beginnings of me turning around. And that's my prayer is that I'll be able to see my son turn around before I go. I don't know how long that's gonna take. I don't know what it's gonna have to take for him. But, you know, my parents, they were willing to suffer. And I'm willing to suffer for my son, too, you know, and there's no other way. You, there, there is no love without free will. And there is no love and, and, and freedom without suffering. And if you, if, you, if you truly love your child and you move past the ego, you move past the embarrassment of them shaming your family and, and what, what will people think. If you move past that and just get to the reality that that is a soul and that that soul is from you and of you, through you and by you, and, and you really find that place of loving them. And it doesn't matter what they do in regards of how people look at you, but just you hurt and you agonize for them you 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 embrace that suffering if you can do that then your prayers will be efficacious then your prayers will be heard but if you're praying out of vanity if you're praying because you're embarrassed and you don't want people to think that you're a bad family or or whatever the case is your prayers won't go past the ceiling you need you need to have the suffering and um 
And you need that faith, faith not knowing doctrines, but faith trusting in Jesus Christ, who there is no name under heaven and earth that, that is greater. That's, that's, the, that's all I know. That's all I know. That's beautiful, Father. Thank you. Um, I always ask this of, of priests that I get to speak with. Could you um, offer a blessing for me and for anybody that's listening? Sure. Oh, sure. thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus Christ, you who suffered all things for all men, through the intercessions of St. Cyprian of Antioch, the intercessions of St. Paul the Apostle and the Evangelist. The intercessions of St. Mary of Egypt. Who became pure out of love and devotion to you and to your mother. Be now with Joseph. Be now with all of his viewers who are seeking healing, hope, and transfiguration. Be with them, Lord. And be with all of us. Be with the whole world, Lord. We need you. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Through the prayers of all the saints and your holy immaculate mother lord jesus christ holy father and holy spirit have mercy on us bless us preserve us and save us amen wow thank you father god god bless you i'd love to talk to you again yeah anytime joseph god bless you thank god you, bless you.